Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Masayan Otomi. And I'd, I'd like to start this uh, first plenary session of this meta conference. And also, uh, it is my great pleasure to chair uh, this first plenary session. Okay. So, the first speaker is uh, uh, Jeremy Baumberg uh, from uh, Cambridge. So, the title of his talk is Pico Cavities and Confining Light Below the Size of an Atom. Great. Uh, I think there's 30 minutes for the talk and five minutes for the question. Okay. Good morning. So uh, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for bringing us together. Uh, it's wonderful to have in person conferences. I think we know now why we need to meet together to argue and discuss science. So uh, hopefully, this will be of interest to you. So uh, this is a sort of journey I'm going to tell you about, uh, which sort of five years ago, I don't think we would have imagined that it would be possible. But I'm really going to explain how we think that we're now confining light to the volume of single atoms and then what we can do with it. And so this work is, uh, oops, hopefully it is. And hopefully appearing as we learn to deal with online presentations as well. Uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, it's, as you'll see, quite multidisciplinary because it involves optics, physics, materials, chemistry, uh, and I'll show you briefly sort of biotechnology as well. Ha. I won't touch a yeah. thing. Um, so uh, there's a lot of people involved in this work, and I'm going to particularly uh, draw your attention to, to Bart, uh, Shu, Ivana, and Rohit, who've done a lot of the experiments, and I'll point out other people as we go along. And then it's a multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. So uh, we have particular help from the Service of Javier Puya uh, group in San Sebastian, and also Angela de Machildu uh, in uh, Birmingham and also Dina Roster in uh, UCL. So uh, I think you're all aware that uh, when we can find light with dielectric structures of any sort, uh, it's very nice, but the real problem for nano um, optics person is that the actual volume you're gonna confine the light to is always going to be the scale of the wavelength in the material cubed or so. So it's embarrassingly large if you're a nanophotonics person. So that's a real problem, as I'll show you later, if you're trying to interact with small numbers of the quasi particles in the system, for instance, the phonons on the electrons, because all of those interactions scale as the optical volume, uh, one over the optical volume to some power, which means if you want to look at single electrons or single bonds, then it's very, very difficult to do it in some sort of dielectric cavity like this. And so that's where plasmonics comes in, and I'm sure most of you are all aware of that. So when I'm actually looking at the interaction, I'm shining light onto some sort of uh, noble metal structure, plasmonic metal structure. It's the fact that I'm inducing these dipoles in the structure, and those dipoles are then interacting with each other, which allows me to confine light extremely tightly. And so if I have a single nanostructure, the problem is the confinement of light is still only the scale of 10 to 100 nanometers. So it doesn't really help me so much in this uh, uh, trying to interact with single quasi particles. But when I have two such objects and I bring them very close together, in the last few nanometers, the light gets trapped really, really strongly in that gap. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And at the same time, the modes that get trapped in the gap scale off into the infrared. And then the light gets enhanced in here by many orders of magnitude. And I'll show you up to a thousand fold enhancement of light in that gap. But the main problem is that you have to construct these gaps extremely precisely to the sort of scale of 0.1 nanometers. And the key question is, how are you going to manage to do that? Now, a few years ago, we showed there's a limit to this, which is about the scale of 0.4 nanometers, because then electrons that build up in one optical cycle on one side of the gap can quantum mechanically tunnel through the gap. So essentially, quantum mechanics will short out the gap at the scale of 0.4 nanometers. Now, we produced this formula then, and we didn't really take it seriously. And I'll show you. So what it has in here is that quantum mechanical limit, but it also has the size of the particular nanostructure you're looking at. 
And what we didn't do is we didn't just assume that actually we could get down to the size of a single atom. But that's what I'll show you can actually work. Now, there are loads of different directions that you'll see throughout this conference that people have taken this idea of light trapping and, and uh, uh, plasmonics. So there's a whole lot of uh, technical questions about what you can do with this, and I'll show you little bits of that. And then there's a whole range of different application spaces that you can access through this. So I'll just talk about a few of them. And, and as I'll say, you'll see huge numbers in the talk. So nowadays, we're starting to be able to look at single photon sources at room temperature through this plasmonic confinement. Or you'll see a number of talks where people are looking at the ability to use light, but then direct it into molecules to get catalysis very efficiently. Uh, I'll show you in a second this idea that you can do sensing of very uh, of trace analytes in a routine way. Uh, and then also there are ideas, for instance, where you can make uh, wallpapers which change color, or buildings which change color, for instance, to reflect the light on days like this. So, in fact, you'll see a talk from uh, Yuling this afternoon, if you want to go to 1A17, where she'll talk about wrapping polymers that you can change the properties of around these plasmonic structures. And I'll talk about nanomachines and active materials tomorrow. So we have a whole range of different directions that we can go in. And this sensing one is particularly interesting, so I'll just mention it briefly. So what we learned to do over the last number of years was to be able to take these nanoparticles and attach them very closely together to the scale, in this case, of 0.9 nanometers using a very special molecule which glues the nanoparticles together very effectively but it's also hollow, so it can entrap analytes into the middle of it, a little barrel-shaped molecule. And what it does is it epitomizes why plasmonics can be useful in sensing, because Raman scattering of molecules that are trapped in these hot spots between the nanoparticles scales as the optical field to the power of four. So if you get a thousand-fold enhancement in the optical field, then you get a 10 to the 12-fold enhancement in this surface-enhanced Raman effect, so you can start to see single molecules. And the nice thing, you don't have to attach anything to your molecules, it's tagless, so you can start to screen for very large numbers of molecules. So, in fact, you can see that the Raman scattering is very distinct from different molecules, and when you put molecules inside this barrel, you can see their lines appear. What's also nice is that when you put molecules inside, it sort of stretches the barrel, and you can see that from these lines here, which uh, broaden and split when you're putting things inside which are large. And so you can start to be very quantitative about this sort of spectroscopy. And that's what we've progressed over the last few years. So we're getting to the stage where we're actually trying to look, uh, build something which is low cost enough to go into a toilet and actually can screen your urine. We can look at neurotransmitters and hormones at the moment. And it allows you to, to bring in this idea of uh, 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 biosensors 2.0 or personalized medicine, where you can track people's small molecule uh, 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 small molecules, uh, biomolecules in their body over long periods of time. So you can't use any of the traditional methods of sensing like mass spec to be able to look at somebody's health over very long periods of time. And for that, optics in the end, I think is going to be really crucial. Though my, my group prefer to work on cannabis and, and whiskey, I'm afraid. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you mostly about today is the system where instead of looking at very, very many uh, nanogaps, we're just going to look at one nanogap because we really want to understand what happens at the very smallest scale when we interact light and matter. And I showed you already that the dimer was the really nicest system that you could work in where you bring two nanoparticles very close together, but it's very difficult to make routinely and robustly with the same precise nanostructure. What's nice is that this is isomorphic to this system I'm showing you here, which we call the nanoparticle or mirror, where you take a ground plane, which in this case is gold, you make a very, very thin spacer layer, and you put a nanoparticle on the top. And the reason that that's very nice is it's very easy to make, but also because the, the, the facet on this nanoparticle here, there's no registration issues. It sits exactly on the substrate here, and this looks like a dimer. And I'll show you a little bit more about this in a second. But essentially, the take home messages from this are I take a sort of 80, 100 nanometer size nanoparticle and I put it on a spacer layer of one or two nanometers. And what I find is that there's a whole set of modes which gets trapped into that gap. And so there's uh, the optical field of one of those particular modes. 
that the eventual mode volume is on the scale of less 50 to 100 nanometers cubed, so far smaller than the 10 to the 7 nanometers cubed I was showing you for dielectric confinement. But it's extremely robust. So every one of these is essentially the same. And you get very, very strong field in the gap, about 500 times the field that you shine onto this nanoparticle. And then, of course, this light couples to anything that you put into that gap. So then you can look at all sorts of different um, things. Now, one of the things that you always worry about is when you take an emitter and you put it very, very close to metal, the traditional idea is that you quench everything, that essentially all the emission goes into uh, exciting electrons in the metal and radiation is very poor. But that's not true in these systems because these essentially are very impressive waveguide emitters and the radiation competes very strongly with that absorption. So efficiency, emission efficiencies of about 50% are possible so far in these systems. So we can put anything in the gap, so TMDs, polymers, perovskites, magnetic materials, all sorts of things. But I'm gonna show you today mostly molecular materials, where we can assemble these self-assembled monolayers very, very efficiently. So, uh, and they're very robust, so they may be, you know, nanometer scale spacers. And there's all sorts of things that we can enhance in the system. So the reason that this system is, is special is maybe worth a little bit more thought for this optics community here. So essentially, if you have a nanoparticle, you always have a very small amount of facet on it. So the first thing to think about to understand the system is to think about this metal insulator metal waveguide. And you might have thought that as you take that system and as you make the gap smaller and smaller, the light would be squeezed out the side. But that's not true. There's one mode of light in this waveguide here with an in-plane wave vector which actually scales as one over that separation. Essentially, what it says is the light gets slower, but, but, but it's very strongly confined in the gap. And in fact, it pulls out of the metal. So it really sits in the dielectric and it moves very, very slowly in that gap. Here. And it depends on the metal and the dielectric permittivities there. But then what happens is you have a finite size of that metal insulated metal waveguide. And what you find then is these discontinuities allow this plasmon in the gap here to bounce backwards and forwards. And essentially, that's one way of thinking about where these mo discrete modes come from that you can see. So they're just like fabric perro modes. Only this cavity is only a nanometer thick and it's about 10 nanometers long. So it's the smallest sort of fabric perro cavity that we can imagine. And from this model, you can extract all sorts of different parameters. You can get the volume, the field enhancement, the lateral confinement. So I advise you to, to have a look at this review if you want to see some more of that. Now, the problem with that is that the, the, the light is so slow along here that if you like, its effective wavelength is only on the scale of a few nanometers. That's why you can confine it in a fabric perot like this. But the problem is the free space wavelength is so large that the coupling is really bad. So in fact, all of the jewelry, if you have gold jewelry on, you probably have crevices in the jewelry which are nanoscale, which can find light in exactly this way, but we can't couple light into them. It's extremely weak, 10 to the minus 15 or something like that. So we need some way of doing that. And that's where the antenna sort of structures come in. So the size of the nanoparticle also means that it has another mode, an antenna mode. And what you do is you arrange the size and the height of it to give you an antenna resonance which mixes with that cavity resonance. So essentially, it's a bit like impedance matching. So uh, the, the light will actually sequentially go through the antenna and into this gap here. And there's a whole set of different modes here. And I'm mainly going to talk about this, this lowest fundamental mode, the one zero mode, but there are other modes and they all emit in different directions. And this mode here, because the dipole is vertical, it emits at high angle. So uh, that's the irritation about it in some way. And the 1 1 mode actually emits normally, but it's a much weaker confinement. This is the strongest confinement, particularly when you get a very small gap system. So you make these systems, and if you look at the scattering of light, you send light in at a high angle, and you just look at the scattering of light in dark field, then you'll actually see very directly those resonances. And that's the lowest order resonance I was telling you about here, which I've labeled L here. This is the coupled mode resonance. And actually, if you look into the dark field by eye, that's just what you see. You see this red ring here, which is this mode, and you see a green spot, which is the transverse modes and a whole range of other modes in the system. 
So, and they all look the same. If I measure this, as I'll show you later, we typically measure this peak position here for thousands and thousands of these across the sample, all essentially look the same. So they'll all essentially they have the same gap, the same gap content. Now, if I shine light onto this system, then it's, it's very intense in that gap. And I put a whole set of molecules in this gap. This is a biphenyl system, BPT, which is a, the file attaches to gold and it makes a very robust monolayer, which is about 1.2 nanometers high. So if I actually put my laser at this point here and then the scattered light comes out resonantly enhanced by this plasmon, I see very, very, very strong Raman scattering. So, I mean, it, you know, almost by eye, you can see the Raman scattering itself. Uh, and these are all the vibrational modes of this particular molecule here. So we can track this molecule. And in fact, this is extremely stable. So if I just do this many, many times, I can actually do this very fast because there's so much light. And I can look at this, this set of molecules. And there's about 100 molecules sitting in the gap in that mode volume there. So we can actually look at these and they're very stable. And we can just track these molecules over time. So that's what we're going to do in a whole set of experiments that I'll show you. Uh, so I'll just show you a few of the examples of the sort of things that we can do. And I'm not going to go into them in any detail, but you're welcome to come and talk to me about them afterwards. So for instance, this is a CO2 uh, catalyst, it's a reduction catalyst here. So the CO2 binds somehow into this nickel uh, terpy system. Uh, so what we can do is we can build this into a nanoparticle or mirror system. It sits in an electrochemical uh, cell here. This is a working electrode here using the mirrors, the ground plane here, and the molecules sit in the gap there. And we can interrogate them while we're doing the catalysis. This is electrocatalysis in this particular case. So what it allows us to do is we can look at the vibrational states of this molecule as it interacts with CO2 and as the electrons move around on the system. So it's very difficult to do this normally, and by just looking then at this uh, vibrational spectrum as you cycle the voltage backwards and forwards, when you're interacting with the CO2, you can start to see how the bonds um, break. So in fact, the CO2 binds into this nickel center here and it breaks that coordination bond there. But what we find is in fact, the electron transfer happens through this tether to the substrate. So that's one sort of thing that you can do. We can also look at molecular electronics, which has been a difficult thing to, to, to get to technology over the last number of years because people have found that the contact geometry for molecules which you're trying to make into electronic devices is completely crucial and they haven't really understood you know what's the problem how do you actually construct really good electrodes so this is again in fact the same molecule i showed you before a slight variant with two phenyl rings that we put in this nanoparticle mirror configuration here and now what we do is we contact the top of the nanoparticle so we can put an electrical voltage across it while we're looking at the, the Raman scattering. What, it, what we find in this system is that at a critical voltage, which depends on the particular molecule there, then the Raman scattering changes completely. And this is not something you've seen in the transport measurements. There's nothing going on at this particular point here. And what seems to be going on is that the molecule actually starts to want to twist. When you put a certain bias across the molecule, it would like actually to drop that bias, not at the contact, but in the middle of the molecule. And it does that by twisting the molecule. And essentially it's because the capacitance is lower. So the energy is lower when it does that. So that, that, that basically changes, that threshold changes with different sorts of molecules. And it goes away if you make a molecule which can't twist. So the problem for molecular electronics is you can't get this out of transport measurements. It's only out of optics that you can see this sort of effect going on. Then more recently, in the last year or so, we've actually shown that you can also can find mid-infrared light in the same gaps here. So if I take this uh, nanoparticle on a disk, and this disk is actually designed to be resonant with mid-infrared light, then what we can do is we can trap the mid-infrared light and the visible light in the same locations. That allows us to play quite a nice trick because we can start to do up conversion dependent on the vibrational states of this molecule. So these are, this is the vibrational ladder of a particular vibration in the molecule. So this is the ground state and the first vibrationally excited state. And what I can do is I can shine mid-infrared light onto that construct so that I excite all the molecules in the gap into this first vibrational state. But then I can do a Raman scattering event with a visible photon. So I take this up to a virtual state. And when it comes down, it goes back down to the ground state. So the light comes out bluer. 
So it comes out to higher energy. So we make a whole section of these uh, 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 structures. And what we can show is that the anti-Stokes Raman actually increases when the mid-infrared light is on. It's a form of up-conversion process, but so far this is only able to be done by, with very high intensity pulses. And what we show here is that you can actually do it at room temperature with CW light, and it makes a quite a promising sort of mid-infrared detector. And we've carried on this line, and, and uh, we'll, we'll show more of it. But in fact, what we've been trying to do is to look at what the best molecules you can put in the gap are. And so there's some machine learning that we've been training the system to, to look at, to find out which bonds are best for doing this. So there's a whole variety of different things that we can do with the system. And for those people who've actually seen me talk in recent uh, months, I'm actually just signposting to some extra things that, that have now been going on. So for instance, one thing that we're able to do is to look at the dark field spectrum and understand the shape of the facet on the nanoparticle. And depending on the nanoparticles you have, these can be circular or triangular or square. Or you can look at different sorts of nanoparticles, for instance, cubical ones with a different facet. This is a 100 facet compared to a 111 facet. Other things that you can do is you can put emitters into these structures and you can find that the emission is vastly speeded up. So for instance, if you take a phosphorescent molecule, it now emits too fast for us to measure. So it starts out at microsecond emission times and it goes to sub picosecond emission times. And you also break some of the selection rules for that emission as well. Uh, and more recently, we've started to make a few molecules lays in such structures as well. Then you can actually look at where are the molecules in the gap emitting from. And if I look in the far field at the Raman sketch and I see some emission pattern which changes depending on where the molecules emit from. Or I can look at the line width of this resonance here and I can see that it depends on the absorption of the molecules in the gap. So as you tune that line across the absorption, you can see the line width change. Uh, and then finally, uh, you'll hear Ruben Esteban talk tomorrow about optomechanical effects in the system. When you drive them, you drive these vibrations, it actually changes, uh, well, you drive them by light, it actually changes the mechanical, the vibration oscillations as well. Uh, and I'll actually do this. Right, so what I want to do is to spend the last part of my talk trying to explain to you how we go beyond this, where we've confined light to the level of, you know, 10 to 100 nanometers cubed to even smaller confinement what we call pica cavities, so sub nanometer cavities. And this starts off with some experiments we did now more than five years ago, where we were trying to, to, to actually look at this at low temperature and really understand what's happening in some of the strange uh, uh, data you get from the system. So I'm going back to this vibrational ladder that I was showing you before. And normally when we do Raman sketch, we go from the ground state to some virtual state, and we scatter back to this first vibrational state here. So we get a Stokes photon. And that Stokes photon is then seen to the low energy side of the laser or the longer wavelength side of the laser. So we put in, for instance, 633 light and we look on the long wavelength side and 700 nanometers, we see the light comes out, which is this Stokes sketch right here. But of course, I've already shown you the reverse path is possible. So I can go from the first state up to this virtual state and then down to the ground state, and that gives me the blue shifted photon, which is the analog. So that's the anti-Stokes process. And essentially, the ratio of these two tells me the occupation of that n equals one state. So it's a way of measuring temperature, and you'll see various talks in this conference where people are using that. So when we do an experiment at low temperature, we don't expect to see anything on the anti-Stokes side because this energy splitting here for these molecules I'm showing you is far above room temperature. So indeed, most of the time we see nothing on the anti-stoke side, except occasionally we see extremely strong emission on the anti-stoke side, which is actually about the same intensity as that on the stoke side. So if I calculated a temperature for this, it would be thousands of degrees. It would be above the melting temperature of gold. So that's not what's going on. Instead, what's going on is somehow I'm driving with a light, I'm driving lots of excitation of this n equals one state. And that's because the optomechanical coupling, essentially the, the strength of this light phonon coupling is so large. So, so what I can do is use this experiment to actually measure that optomechanical coupling. All I have to do is when I see this effect here is I scan the laser power and I look at the occupation of that state and I can extract this G. And this formula here 
actually depends on parameters that we mostly know. The only parameter we don't really know is the volume of the optical mode. So how tightly the optical mode is confined. So we can do this many times, and we find from these Gs here that the volume seems to be less than a nanometer cube when we get into this state here. That's why we call this peak count. So the only way to really understand what's going on here is that uh, we think that the, inside this gap here, the light is pulling out a single gold atom from one of the facets. And we think the facets are initially completely flat because of van der Waals interactions, which sort of squash them completely. But then when the light is on, we can pull out a single gold atom and the light is enhanced around that gold atom, just like a lightning rod. So this is scaling down lightning rods all the way to the atomic level. And indeed, although one can't do these calculations completely, one can take very small systems where you can do time-dependent DFT, and you can show that that is, seems to be what's going on. The light can indeed be localized around single atoms uh, like this. So you also see these effects in the selection rules breaking. So you see infrared lines, you see new effects going on. And so somehow these are light-induced forces. So I'm gonna talk about them a bit more. So uh, what we can now do is actually these experiments completely happy at room temperature, because even at room temperature, uh, these are mostly not excited systems. You don't see any, so I'm scattering. And I'm gonna show you an experiment here done by uh, Jack and Bart, where uh, uh, what we've done is we've taken a molecule in the gap here, which is a biphenyl, but it's got this C triple bond N right at the top of the molecule. And that's a nice bond to look at because it's a very high energy bond away from every other part of the spectrum. So if I look at a typical sort of um, scan like this, you'll see these are the, the ring modes and this mode here is the CN bond around 21, uh, 22 wave, 2200 wave numbers. So that's this black spectrum here. That's what normally happens. But if I turn up the laser intensity enough, and by enough, I mean sort of 50 microns. So these are very small powers that you need to start uh, seeing these sort of effects, CW at room temperature. So what happens is you see this peak of cavity form, this strange track here. So what's going on, we think, is that we're pulling out a single gold atom from the facet here, and it's coming close to the CN bond. And what it does is it steals some of the electron density from that CN bond, so it makes it weaker. So that particular CN bond now shows up weaker than all the rest of the other 100 molecules in the gap, which you basically see unchanged. So what this shows you is this is the, the, the Raman scattering of a single bond in real time at room temperature, and you can see it moving around. What's happening is actually the electron density here is moving around as this gold atom here moves around very, very slightly on the scale of 0.1 nanometer or so. And you can use DFT to show that looks about right. When I bring a gold atom close, I get a coordination bond here, which steals electron density from that triple bond and it steals about a third of an electron. We can also use this to say, how often does this peak of cavity move up from the bottom compared to the top? For this particular molecule, it mostly comes from the bottom and not from the top, because from the top, that's when you see the CN line change, but from the bottom, you only see the ring lines change. So we can actually use this. If you have DFT, we can actually invert this whole system to actually uh, make a movie from all the different lines changing around here. You see there are all these correlations here. That allows us to use DFT to reconstruct a video of that single molecule as this gold ad atom is very close to the CN bond. And what you can see is this actually looks like as this gold atom flips around between different ad atom sites, then the molecule itself bends uh, and twists. So, this is a way now to watch single molecules at room temperature doing different things. So um, what I'm gonna do is just leave with this here, which is actually trying to understand how does this all work? So uh, we've said that what we're seeing is a single gold atom, which is pulled out from the facet, but it's actually pulled out by light. If I don't shine any light on the system, or if I only shine very weak light on the system, we don't see this at all. So somehow it's the interaction between the metal, the molecule, and the light that's producing these. And if I just calculate the optical forces, as I'll show you in a second, the traditional way of calculating optical forces gives you something which is a thousand times weak to explain this. 
So if I look, for instance, at the formation time, oh, sorry, yeah, what, what I do in these experiments now is I look at how long it takes until I see the first peak of cavity. And I look at the function of intensity for a particular molecule. Uh, and what you can see is essentially there looks like there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of particular probability, a particular rate of formation. And it's not deterministic. I don't always get a peak of cavity. What I do is I get some sort of, um, I'm, I'm changing the barrier as we'll see, and I'm getting some probability of creating these peak cavities. And at the same time, also I can watch them go away. And there's two decay rates in the system, a slow rate, which is basically the same as the formation time, and also a very fast rate. And I'll concentrate here just on the formation rate, but the decay is very similar. So if I look at that formation rate for a whole set of different molecules here, then you can see that it varies. And it's actually very strange. What happens is I need a particular light threshold before I start to see these peak cavities. Then I get some sort of S-shaped curve and then it saturates. So any sort of typical traditional um, model that you have, uh, for instance, for optical forces doesn't explain data like that. So one of the reasons is, so if I just take a particular, this is the, 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 the gradient force, so what I would need is nanonewtons because I need about an electron volt to pull a gold atom out of that facet. I'm only moving it 0.3 nanometers. Uh, but, but this force, if I just calculate uh, from this, uh, the, the field around this gold atom here, I've only got picanewtons. So the model that we have is something like this. So when I'm shining light on a, an ad atom as it's starting to come out, I generate a dipole very strongly inside it. That's what gives me the extra field in this hot spot here. But that dipole field now starts to polarize the end of the molecule. And we can't use the idea of refractive index now because the light is just concentrated on the very end of the molecule. So we actually have to do DFT to look at the polarizability of the electrons right at the tip atom of the molecule. But then as that electron density shifts around, it's screened by all the electrons in the metal there. So in fact, that amplifies it very strongly. So what you get is a dipole formed on the tip of the molecule, which is enhanced by the metal, and then you get a very strong dipole-dipole interaction. So that's the origin of this thousandfold enhanced force. And the best way to think about it is something like a light-induced van der Waals interaction, which reduces the uh, barrier which binds the gold to the surface. So it sort of dissolves the barrier. This is really important for areas like photocatalysis or molecular electronics, anywhere we have light interacting with molecules on a metal surface, which is actually a lot of technology. So we're just really trying to understand, but the interesting thing is that uh, we're not capable as a community of solving our classical light with our quantum you know, system, molecule in this case, on the same footing. We need to have photons in DFT at the same level, and that's currently impossible to do. So we can also start to do things like looking at single protons moving around. So this is a system where we have a carboxylate, and what you can see is a, in the Raman scattering here, you can see a flipping around. It's very different from what I showed you before, which is a wandering. If you trace that out, you'll find that what we're seeing is a single proton, which can bind to the carboxylate, or it can actually deprotonate and actually the molecule combined to the gold ad atom, and we can actually watch that very directly in time. So this data here is watching a single proton binding and unbinding, and the molecule binding to the gold. And we can start to then look at the energy, the energy landscape around that just by looking at the statistics of this in time. So although we normally think about pH being averaged over millions and millions of protons, I can get the same effect by looking at a single proton and watching it over time. And then statistically, I can define the ideas of pH. And in this system here, it seems to change over time. So there are all sorts of things that uh, are going to be relevant when we start to look at these gold atoms moving around. We can look at electron tunneling or catalysis. We can use light to try and drive atoms around in different directions. We can try and look at coupling to emitters in systems like this. We can try and induce redox chemistry. And we, look at, we can also look at how electrochemistry works in such systems, which is probably dominating as well. So there are very many interesting directions that we can start to do when we can find light down to these really small scales. So what I hope I've convinced you is that it's possible to make rather stable constructs, which self-assemble, you don't need even lithography, to, to give you very nice tight light confinement down to this 
uh, tens of nanometer scale. Uh, and then, so there's lots of things that you can do already with that. For instance, you can make enhanced mid infrared detectors. Uh, you can look at uh, molecules analyzed in, in, in real systems. Uh, but then you also, it allows you to confine the light even more tightly when we move individual atoms and molecules around in the system. So I've shown you this sort of lightning rod effect on a single atom scale that confines light to the sort of 1.1 nanometer scale. And I've shown that we're just starting to get the glimmerings of understanding of how forces work on such small um, length scales. And, you know, essentially quantum mechanics comes into play. We really need to understand quantum mechanics on the same uh, footing as uh, electromagnetism, as light, to really get an understanding of what's going on. So I hope that's been of interest. Thank you very much. Oh, very exciting talk. Thank you. So the other question times. So is there any question or comments from the audience? Okay, can you come up? I, I'll, I'll repeat it. Oh. Okay, let me see if you can repeat it. Uh, well, well, you saw this mechanism of leaking uh, blockade So, so the question is, if, if as we bring out this gold ad atom, is it possible it's not a, a direct optical force, but something to do with hot electrons in the system? Which is a very good question. So uh, if you just look directly at the sort of force you expect from the hot electrons that people are talking about at the moment, which are a very small fraction of the light you put in, that would certainly not be enough. But you could imagine a hot atom effect. So in a hot atom effect, the plasma would be given, all the energy would all be given to a particular gold atom. So that's, you know, would be possible, but it doesn't explain the data at all. So for instance, we know that the light's also responsible for putting the gold atom back into the facet. And that's not what a hot atom effect would explain at all. But you have to try and think about everything. Good question. Any other questions? Too early in the morning. You'll have to shout really loudly. I can if you shout. So the, the nice thing about a dimer is it's a single construct. Uh, sorry, yeah, the question is, why is a dimer a nice system to work with, which I started out with and I just mentioned in passing. And the reason is because, uh, you know, a dimer, if you could make 100% um, dimers, you could actually solution process them. So you could also orient them so they would emit light vertically. So a bit like a, a nanorod, it would emit in the particular directions that you wanted. The problem about them, as I said, is that all nanoparticles are faceted. And if not, they become faceted when you put them together. And so if I take a dime, if I take two um, plasmonic nanoparticles and I bring them close together, the alignment around that gap that it's as soon as they touch, they stick and they stick in completely different configurations. So imagine that you've got, say, cubes, which are perfectly well defined. Even then, the overlap is completely different. And so the problem is essentially you can think about it as an optical capacitor. So the overlap area varies. And if you look at dimers, then you'll find that the, the spectrum of that dimer mode is like all the way through the visible and near infrared. If you look at, you know, they're all different. Whereas if I look here, I didn't show you, but basically they're all within a few nanometers of each other, that plasma mode. And it's because the facet always sees the full mirror. Now, the reason that's not so nice is the mirror is just, you know, it's, it's extended. So it's a real pain to simulate. Simulations are much easier with dimers as well. So, but, but I, as far as I see, nobody's made reproducible dimers uh, with 100% yield that make, don't make trimers and these aggregates as well. So that's still a challenge for the community, I would say. Good question. So I think the question was, how do I understand the, the dipole as, a, as an antenna or as a tip? Is it 
So it's a great question. So what happens if I have an emitter, maybe not just a TMBAC, but any sort of emitter in the gap next to this, I'm generating this dipole. And so in fact, we've been working for the last few years, trying to understand emission in the system. And I'm not showing you very much about it because I don't really understand it at the moment. So we have to understand when we're looking at Raman scattering, it's maybe easier because you're thinking about an emitter, which is essentially the length of a bond. I mean, the vibrational dipoles are a bond size. But when we're talking about a visible light emitter, we have a delocalized dipole, which has to be if we want to have a visible emitter. So it's over many, many bonds. And then we have to understand what happens if I have an optical antenna, a dipole very close to one end of that. That's completely different from the coupling of that dipole to free space where a wavelength is very large. Now my optical mode is smaller than the dipole. So what has to happen is we break all the selection rules in the system. Indeed, we break all the selection rules in the system, but actually how to even think about the emission is un unclear in the system. How do I speed up some part of that dipole emitter or not? So we're trying to go back and redesign. So in TMDCs, it's even more complicated when you have a delocalized exciton over many unit cells. So it's, it's a, a very interesting area, I would say. So people would love to get strong coupling because normally you should get single molecule strong coupling in such a system at room temperature with huge splittings. Um, but I think it's more complicated. Great question. Okay, so we have to move on. So let's speak again. Oh.